Welcome to part one in our glycogen, biosynthesis, and metabolism lecture series. In this section, we will discuss insulin signaling and glycogen synthesis. Recall that glycogen is a large polymer of glucose residues connected in the main chain by alpha-1,4 linkages and with branching side chains about every 12 to 15 residues at the alpha-1,6 position. The reducing ends of the carbohydrate, two for each polymer, are connected to the glycogenin dimeric protein. With the branching nature of the polymer, many non-reducing ends of the molecule are present. This allows for easy access and fast release of glucose for energy utilization. Most of the body's pools of glycogens are stored in the liver, with 10% of the liver biomass in glycogen granules and in skeletal muscles, with glycogen comprising 2% of the biomass of the muscle. Each glycogen polymer may have upwards of 30,000 glucose residues, making the glycogen polymer visible using standard microscopic techniques. Storage of glycogen within muscle tissue is used by the muscle cells as a source of energy to fuel muscle contraction. In the liver, the purpose of glycogen storage is different. Glycogen stored at this location is used to maintain the homeostatic balance of blood glucose levels. The liver is the primary organ that can actively transport glucose into the bloodstream. Our only other major source of glucose within the blood is from our diet. The brain has huge energy demand, but nearly zero storage of key energy molecules required for ATP production. Furthermore, glucose and ketone bodies are the only energy sources that can pass the blood-brain barrier and be utilized by the brain for ATP production. Note that ketone bodies are only produced during starvation or disease states such as diabetes and are not a regular source of energy for the brain. Thus, glucose is critical for brain function. Nearly 10% of the whole body's energy is used for nerve impulse transmission by the brain. If blood flow to the brain carrying critical oxygen and glucose is impeded, people will lose consciousness within approximately 20 seconds. And brain death or permanent brain damage occurs within 4 minutes of blood flow cessation. This exemplifies the importance of the liver in maintaining blood glucose levels as well as the importance of oxygen maintenance. Glycogen in the liver or muscle can be broken down into glucose 1-phosphate. This can be interconverted to glucose 6-phosphate, which is readily used in many cellular processes. The process of glycolysis or the breakdown of glucose into pyruvate occurs in all cells and produces a small amount of ATP in the process. Further processing of pyruvate can occur anaerobically or in the absence of oxygen to produce lactate or the process can continue to occur in the aerobic pathway to complete oxidation to carbon dioxide and water in the Krebs cycle. Note that oxygen from breathing is used to create the water within this step. This fuels the process of oxidative phosphorylation within the mitochondria and produces large quantities of ATP, 36 molecules per glucose. Within the liver, glucose can be freed from glycogen and released back into the bloodstream to maintain homeostatic levels. Glucose 6-phosphate can also be utilized as a precursor for other major macromolecules such as ribose and deoxyribose as well as the hexosamine compounds commonly found cushioning joints or attached to proteins in the plasma membrane. In healthy individuals, hormone signaling is critical to maintain blood glucose homeostasis. Within this system, the hormones glucagon and insulin work together to maintain normal plasma glucose levels. During hyperglycemia, Pancreatic beta cells release insulin. Pancreatic beta cells release insulin, which stimulates glucose uptake by energy consuming cells and the formation of glycogen in the liver. During hypoglycemia, pancreatic alpha cells release glucagon, which stimulates gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis in the liver and the release of glucose into the plasma. 
The first area we will focus our attention on will be the mechanism utilized by insulin to reduce blood glucose levels. This is the structure of the pancreas and its anatomical relationship with the liver and the stomach. The pancreas is the sensor organ that detects blood glucose levels. It is responsible for the signaling to the liver to either remove or release glucose in response to changing levels. Notably, the pancreas also produces most of the digestive enzymes utilized by the body, including proteases, amylases, and lipases. We will return to this activity of the pancreas during later lectures. Right now, let's focus on the pancreatic islet cells. They are responsible for the production of glucagon and insulin. The islets are distinguished from the surrounding tissue by a continuous connective tissue capsule and extensive vascularity. The islet cells that secrete glucagon known as alpha cells are stained in red, while the beta cells that produce insulin are stained in blue. Insulin is a peptide hormone composed of 51 amino acids. It's produced as a longer propeptide called proinsulin that needs to be processed by protein cleavage and folding to obtain proper structure. The peptide is first translated on ribosomes linked to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, ER, where a signal peptide docks the peptide to the ER membrane. The proinsulin is folded and the signal peptide cleaved. It's transported to the Golgi where it's further packaged into secretory vesicles. Within the secretory vesicles, the proinsulin is cleaved to release the C peptide. The A and B peptides are held together by disulfide bridges and form the active insulin component. The C peptide is a bioactive peptide secreted at the same time and in equimolar amounts to the insulin hormone. It also has a longer half-life than insulin and is excreted by the kidneys into the urine, making detection easy. Furthermore, it allows for the detection of patient-produced insulin, even if they're receiving insulin injections. Thus, C-peptide detection is often utilized to help distinguish between patients with type 1 diabetes from patients with type 2 diabetes or maturity onset diabetes. Details about the different forms of diabetes will be discussed in greater detail in a later lecture. Once insulin is released from the pancreas, it travels throughout the body and binds with cellular targets that contain the insulin receptor. The insulin receptor is a tyrosine kinase receptor that dimerizes upon insulin binding. Insulin receptors are located on most cell types throughout the body, causing pleiotropic effects during insulin response. Primary targets of insulin action are the liver, where it promotes the uptake of glucose and the production of the glycogen storage molecule, as well as skeletal muscle and fat. The tyrosine kinase portion of the receptor located on the internal side of the plasma membrane is a dynamic protein with many moving parts. The active site binds to ATP shown in hot pink and uses it to phosphorylate downstream targets. In the inactive state shown on the left, a mobile loop shown in bright turquoise binds in the active site blocking its action. When the receptor is activated, several tyrosines, shown in green on this loop, are phosphorylated, causing it to swing out of the active site, allowing ATP to enter. Other signaling proteins, a small peptide from one is shown in light pink, then bind and are phosphorylated on their tyrosine residues. The insulin receptor is a tyrosine kinase which undergoes dimerization and autophosphorylation of tyrosine residues upon insulin binding. The phosphorylated receptor recruits and phosphorylates the insulin receptor substrate 1, IRS1, on tyrosine residues, which then recruits the dimeric phosphoinositol PI3 kinase, P85 and P110 in the diagram above, 
and phosphorylates the P85 subunit. The PI3 kinase catalyzes the phosphorylation of phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate, PIP2, within the plasma membrane to form the phosphoinositol 345-triphosphate, or PIP3. PIP3 then recruits the PIP3-dependent kinase PDK, which phosphorylates and activates AKT. Once activated, AKT dissociates from the membrane into the cytosol where one of its downstream targets is the AS160 protein. AS160 is a GTPase that normally binds with the RAB10 G protein, causing cleavage of GTP to GDP. Thus, A160 downregulates the activity of RAB10. In the phosphorylated state, AS160 cannot bind or inhibit the RAB10 protein, enabling RAB10 to release GDP and bind with a molecule of GTP. In the activated state, RAB10 helps promote the fusion of GLUT4 containing secretory vesicles, GSVs, with the plasma membrane. The GSVs house copies of the glucose transporter, GLUT4. Fusion of GSVs with the plasma membrane allows for increased surface expression of GLUT4 and upregulation of glucose import into the cell. Having GLUT4 proteins stored within secretory vesicles makes it available more readily than having to activate gene transcription pathways and production of the protein. This allows a faster response to help lower blood glucose levels. The result is increased glucose uptake from the bloodstream into liver cells and other cellular targets, reducing blood glucose levels. Whew, that was a lot. Here is a deeper look at some of the initial activation steps in the insulin signaling pathway. This step shows the phosphorylation of phosphoinositol 4,5-bisphosphate, PIP2, to phosphatidylinositol 3,4,5-triphosphate, PIP3. PIP2 is a common phospholipid within the lipid bilayer structure. In future lectures, we will see the utilization of this phospholipid in other signaling pathways as well. Once glucose enters the cell, it's rapidly converted to glucose 6-phosphate via the enzyme hexokinase. We will revisit this enzyme in more detail in our section on glycolysis. Importantly, phosphorylation traps glucose inside the cell and does not allow it to be transported back into the bloodstream. This helps to maintain the homeostasis of glucose within the bloodstream. In addition, Glucose 6-phosphate is the first step in many pathways utilizing glucose, including energy utilization and the formation of building blocks such as ribose and deoxyribose used in RNA and DNA synthesis. Another important enzyme in glucose metabolism is phosphoglucomutase. This enzyme falls into the isomerase class of enzymes and is able to effectively transfer the phosphate group from the 6 position to the 1 position. This reaction is fully reversible, as shown above. Within this mechanism, a serine residue of the enzyme is covalently linked to a phosphate group. In the reaction shown, the 6' oxygen of glucose attacks the phosphate attached to the serine in the enzyme active site. The serine hydroxyl acts as a good leaving group. This creates a glucose bisphosphate intermediate. As the reaction proceeds, the serine oxygen attacks the phosphate group at the other position, restoring the phosphorylated serine residue of the enzyme and releasing the glucose phosphate isomer. For glycogen biosynthesis, glucose 1-phosphate will be the required form. In the previous slide, we saw that insulin signaling increases the number of GLUT4 transporters in the plasma membrane, causing an increased uptake of glucose into the cell. 
Within liver and muscle tissue, if the glucose is not required for energy or other metabolic intermediates, it is then converted to glycogen for storage. The major enzyme required for glycogen synthesis is also activated via the insulin signaling pathway. In addition to phosphorylating the AS160 protein, activated AKT also phosphorylates the glycogen synthase kinase enzyme, GSK3, which inactivates this protein. This causes protein phosphorylase 1 to dephosphorylate the glycogen synthase enzyme, shifting it into a more active state, causing glycogen synthesis to commence. So we've just talked about two pathways activated during cellular response to insulin signaling, and I'm sure that you're feeling a bit overwhelmed with the complexity. However, biological processes are incredibly complex and signaling pathways have multiple pleiotropic downstream effects. For insulin signaling, we have only touched the tip of the iceberg, as evidenced in the next slide. This diagram created by cell signaling technology tries to capture a more complete picture of the insulin signaling pathway. Now this is overwhelming. We will keep our simplified version for the test, but keep this in the back of your mind. Life is nowhere near as simple as your upper division biochemistry textbooks make it out to be. If we take a closer look at this pathway, we can find the two paths that we were looking at above. First, the activation of the PI3 kinase by the IRS protein, which then converts PIP2 to PIP3. PIP3 is required for the activation of PDK, which in turn phosphorylates AKT. As you can see, AKT has many downstream targets two of which we talked about. The AS160 pathway that leads to the upregulation of GLUT4 transporters in the plasma membrane. Note that this is not the only pathway that is activated by insulin that initiates this response. At least four other pathways are also increasing translocation of the GSVs to the plasma membrane. Thus, signaling pathways often contain redundancies. The second pathway that we discussed was the GSK3 inactivation by AKT. This leads to the dephosphorylation and activation of the glycogen synthase enzyme. Note that the phosphorylation and inactivation of protein phosphatase 1 is also blocked during the signaling cascade, increasing the dephosphorylation of glycogen synthase by PP1. Okay, you made it. Go get a coffee or take a nap now before your next class.